103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Hello and welcome to Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LP FM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Today is Sunday, uh, October 11th, 2020. I'm Larry Rhodes, or Doubter5, and as usual, we have our co-host, Wombat, on the phone with us. Hello, Wombat. What's in the box? What's in the box? The box. <laughs> and cat, <our> ghost. <laughs> dead cat. <laughs> Alive or dead cat. And our guests today are George, Red Leader, and Doubtfire. Hello, all. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, uh, religion, no humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. If you get the feeling you're the only non-believer in Knoxville, well, you're just not. There are several atheist, free-thinking, and rationalist groups that exist right here in Knoxville, and we'll be telling you how you can connect with them right after the mid-show break. Also, did you know that there's been a streaming atheist calling TV slash video show broadcasting in here in yep. Knoxville? It yep. has been for over 10 years. Did you know yep. that one? By- and it's disappointing, too, because The Boys Season 1 was really good. Like You can watch The Boys Season 1 and be like, oh, this is really good. This is a good show. It ends on a, a pretty good cliffhanger. Season 2, terrible script. Okay acting, just introduce oh, a bunch no. of useless characters. No. They're turning into a soap nope. opera. And the worst thing is, if you try to find bad reviews for it, Amazon has cleansed the internet and made all the bad reviews just about the release schedule. Well, there aren't any so, bad reviews for our TV show. Oh, it's so bad. <laughs> it's so no, bad. No, it's, it's just a call-in show where it's anybody can call in and talk to an actual atheist. Uh, we'll tell you more about that after the mid-show break as well. Also, if you'd like to interact with us during the show, go to Facebook and search for Digital Free Thought Radio Hour and use the messaging function to send us questions or comments. Wombat, what do you have for us today? So I recently died and had an amazing dream <laughs> you did. where I saw a bunch of other dead people and we all went to White Jesus and White Jesus was like, hey, what's up, guys? And I was like, oh, my gosh, he was white all along. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? This is great. And then I woke up and I realized it's totally true. That mu- That's all the proof you need. To, to establish what we're going to be talking about today, mm-hmm. near-death experiences, which I think is a really, really interesting uh, phenomenon in terms of how popular it is. I think everyone yep. is aware of the term, even if they've never had the experience. It's sort of like taking on sort of like a meme. Right. And, and so we what need I want to also talk about uh, the difference between ghosts and souls, or if there is a difference. Uh, I started a topic online uh, earlier this week just to discuss that, and I think we might want to hit that later on. Okay, okay. How about this? We'll start off with some pretty good definitions. That way everybody knows what we're talking about. George, I'm going to throw it out to you first. What do you think we mean when we say near-death experience? I have no idea. That's why we count to you. What do you think? What do you think? think? A near-death experience? Yeah. What what do you think? Have you ever had something similar to that? Or uh, what do you even think I'm talking about? Well, um, I I can't say I really do know, honestly. Um, give me your best give me your best guess. How about that? Well, let's see. It's like almost dying, right? Right. Um, I can't remember having almost died. <laughs> it's that simple. I can't talk from experience about this. I just don't have any. Okay, George, we're going to go around. But if you come back and be like, so what's a near-death experience? I would say, hey, you got your shot. (laughs) That's right. Doubter 5, I'm going to throw it out to you. You want to tell me about uh, the basic introduction? Sure. What I understand is that uh, near-death experience is when – you almost die, like George said. But in this particular case, a lot of people will point to um, like a hospital setting where a doctor has actually pronounced you dead. Mm. And then uh, they keep working with you, try to bring you back, or, or even if you just come back on your own and uh, you say, yeah, I was dead, but then I came back. I know what it's like to be dead. Um, yeah. You know, that's anecdotal evidence at best, but uh, a lot of people will point to near-death experiences for that. Their, definitions of uh, afterlife. 
That's pretty good. Doubtfire, it seems like you want to weigh in on this. What do you think a near-death experience is? And have you ever had experiences like that in the past? Yeah, I've never um, came near death, fortunately, but um, near-death experiences are, well, let's look at it like in, the, in history, near-death uh, experiences were near death like approaching death, but now because of our technology of bringing back people from cardiac arrest that's been maybe flatlined for a certain amount of time, they're listed as clinically dead, which is a little different than really dead, I guess. Dead, uh, dead. For some people, dead, dead, and then there's clinically dead. And then, so there's um, anecdotal reports and also papers and reviews about people who actually experience what it was like to be clinically dead. And there's a lot of information on that. And so the description is, uh, they call it the classic near-death experience. Okay. So the classic near-death experience. Classic NDE. Can, yeah, it contains like certain core um, universal experiences. That would be uh, meeting dead loved ones, a life review, seeing a light, out of body experience, and then having the choice to either stay or come back uh, to life. So those are kind of the core essentials. No matter what culture people come from, um, basically those core features remain. Now, some of the coloring of maybe who they spoke to, like I spoke to a light, an atheist might say, I spoke just to some light or some thing. Um, a religious person may say, well, I spoke to Jesus. Mm. Or a Muslim would say, I spoke to Allah. So they interpret the light a little different coming out of it. So it's kind of like a post hoc interpretation of what happened. Yes. But the core essential experience is all the same. It's all common. That's what I understand it to be. That's, that's a great, fantastic answer. Uh, doubt or doubt five, doubt doubt or five and doubt fire. <laughs> yeah. Scott and Larry, both great answers. Dale, I want to throw it out to you. You're on mute. Will you mind taking yourself off mute? And I want to know, um, what's your opinion on what a near death experience is, and have you ever had one or something close to it in the past? Well, I've definitely had a near-death experience, what you're calling that. I used to work for a cardiologist named Dr. Raymond Moody, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called Life After Life, because he documented a lot of the experiences that people had being, being a cardiologist and me being a cardiopulmonary uh, technician. We both had a lot of experience bringing people back from death. I would like to make a few corrections. Clinical death is no longer defined. The used, clinical death used to be not having a breath. Then clinical death used to be not having a heartbeat. Then clinical death eventually became brain waves. So that, that's sort of an old uh, idea. Also, the idea that people experience things uh, in a universal pattern, uh, seeing people, uh, talking, having the choice of coming back, that's just not true. Uh, anybody can experience it but by a loss of blood pressure. Test pilots experience it all the time. Uh, especially if you're put in a centrifuge. What happens is, is you have a drop in blood pressure. And when you have a drop in blood pressure, you start to have tunnel vision. Tunnel vision meaning all your peripheral vision starts going away and the uh, parts of your eye that are most important, that being the center, the part where you read, becomes the... Uh, becomes the last to go away because it gets the most blood supply. So consequently, what you have is a tunnel that's dark on the sides, but whatever light you have is in the center. So you interpret it as a tunnel of very bright light. Wow, that's uh, really cool. That's a, that's a great explanation. And you said you had one. I have had one, yeah. Actually, it is. When did, what happened to you? Oh, uh, so I used to be in the Boy Scouts. 
um, and we went up to this campsite when I was around 12 and we would do our swimming merit badge certifications, basically like, hey, get in this lake, make sure you can swim from one side of the lake to the other side. And if you can do that, then we can start doing our merit badges for swimming. The thing was, we started really early in fall and it, the, the lake water is really cold and the lake's distance was pretty long. It was like maybe the maybe two standard swimming pool lengths and so when i got on the water my 12 year old body you know i'm swimming i'm getting cold i make this to one side of the lake and i'm coming back but my legs start like feeling a lot heavier and i start sinking in the water and i'm actually like physically drowning like i'm getting oxygen deprived i can't get back up and there's a period where i'm just under the water and i'm like ah oh, man this sucks and it's embarrassing but then <laughs> i felt really 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 calm because like my body's going into like hey <laughs> let's check out mode and i have all the hormones just kicking off all at once and it felt really peaceful like i always thought drowning was like this really horrific experience but there's a point where it's like eh, it's okay <laughs> your body just like take a chill pill here's some drugs here's some mental things we've been holding in your gut for a while and i was in that state until i got pulled out of the water i had, to have, I had a lifeguard pull me out um do the whole check on me and stuff like that but I was, a, I was a hardcore Christian back when I was like 12, or as much as you could be when you were a child. And my near-death experience was very much, hey, I felt really calm when I was under the water. But it wasn't until I was informed by other people's near-death experiences that I started to like re-remember the, the experience I had and start to borrow things from their stories. And then all of a sudden, oh, but I was underwater and I felt really calm and there was a white light and there were voices talking to me. And I'm like, in my head, it's like, that's not really how I remembered it the first time. It's just sort of like what I'm borrowing from other people's stories, how like I'm, I'm re-picturing the narrative. Now, when I look back at it now, like in my 30s, it's like, no, I just, I, I, got, I got too cold. I couldn't swim very well. And my body went into a, like a survival sort of like, here's all your comfort hormones, just stay calm, you know, like don't freak out as much anymore and maybe you'll get rescued and that's what happened. But it's very easy for people to misremember things. And I find it also alarming, and Dell, maybe you can weigh on this. It's sort of like um, the, the image that people had of aliens before uh, that one famous movie came out with the gray men, people's impression of what an alien would look like were vastly different. But it wasn't until that movie came out with the big round head and the black eyes that everyone's impression of aliens suddenly became the new, like, a very similar yeah. thing and coalesced into a similar thing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like near that experiences are sort of in that same realm where they're informed by um, the, the ideas of the public. Dale, do you think there's any argument there? I believe that anyone who tries to remember things are going to remember them differently. We have, uh, there's one uh, documented evident, uh, documented case, a girl was drowning and she saw her tunnel as having uh, little tiny squares all over it. And it, more than likely what was happening is she was having tunnel vision and she was seeing the sides of the pool that had tiles on it. Mm. Uh, but uh, your, your thing about uh, inter what well, we interpret clouds, and, and it's the same way you interpret things that are going on. However, what most people talk about is the clinical experience, where you have a loss of blood pressure in an ER or in a surgery, and you are partially awake. Mm -hmm. you, one of the last things to go is the hearing. So people often say they float it, or it has been reported, they would float above their bodies and they could see the doctors working and all of this, and they could see their bodies. What is actually happening is, is they're hearing the dialogue of what's going on around them and their brain, always trying to put things in a logical order, starts to assemble a scene, much mm. in the same way you would do in a dream when the television is on. So uh, one doctor creatively put a uh, tile above the bed in the ER, Okay. Uh, above all the beds, as a matter of fact, and it had a message on it. And he definitively said, well, if anyone wakes up and can tell me what that message is, I'll think maybe they have something, but uh, this is just a phenomenon. Also, when you're when you do actually start having um, oxygen deprivation, I said lack of blood pressure. That's most common. 
in a, in a clinical setting, but when you have oxygen deprivation, it's actually the exact same way. Excuse me, it causes the exact same effect. I'm also going to throw out one extra thing. The stories of floating seems to be uh, co coinciding with loss of equilibrium. Like I know when I lie down in a swimming pool or if I'm swimming on my back, it feels like I'm floating just because the 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 juices in my ear <laughs> to avoid technical terms keeps me from uh realizing what's up and what's down and my brain's like hey you're flying you're floating i don't know what's going on and that's the same sort of like uneasiness but i want to throw out the doubt fire what do you have do you devil, you are, devil doubt fire scott are you willing to play some devil's advocate with us here because yeah. i don't want us to go around yep. in a big old echo chamber let's keep it interesting yeah that's right so the thing about it is i'm doubt fire so i believe in healthy skepticism but i'm also mm. skeptical of my own skepticism nice so it's that's good to, to yeah it's good to uh question everything and look at it so if we um so you know first thing if if we're looking at science to kind of understand how the world works right so what does science actually say on the matter what the, what the, what do we have so uh, in a little bit of preparation for this um i don't know if you guys are familiar with ncbi it's a site that means um, what it stands for is the National Center of Biotechnology and Information. And so, so what they do is they put out peer reviewed uh, journals. Mm -hmm. So these could be like medicine, PubMed, uh, peer reviewed, um, you know, you'll have journal citations and papers and things like that. So they have papers on near death experiences. And what have they found? Like one of the latest ones is from um, Jeffrey Long, who is a medical doctor, and his conclusion, and I'll just, you, you, and I, you know, for the audience, I would say if you're interested in this kind of stuff, go to NCBI um, and just look up near death experience and you'll find it. But his conclusion is this. Let me just drop down because I'm kind of reading through it. There's basically six lines of evidence uh, to kind of explain what. NDEs really are. Now, it's good to note also as well that there's only like 20% of people that actually remember their near-death experience. So that's the first thing. And that's mm -hmm. another question in, 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 of, in and of itself. But Jeffrey Long, and I'll quote him, he says, um, <clears throat> he says that, hold on, I just missed it. Oh, I'm sorry. Keeping this exciting, Scott. <laughs> yeah, keeping it exciting, man. So basically what he's saying is because of the six lines of evidence, um, there's reasonably convincing evidence that something inexplicable is going on that's different than just oxygen deprivation. Mm -hmm. um, oxygen deprivation gives you a few of those biological um, uh, that results from, you know, our biology and losing um, like the tunnel vision, like was just sure. mentioned. But there's other parts of the near death experience that is that are inexplicable. That's what the conclusion is. They don't really know what's going on. But for all intents and purposes, NDEs are real experiences as, as far as we define real. Yeah, so there's there's a silver lining what? when it comes to a, a scientific report. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of like UFOs. Like, it, if right. people can see a UFO as an unidentified flying object, and those exist, no doubt. But it's not good proof of visitation from intelligent life right. by alien right. saucers. That's, that's exactly right. what I'm saying, is that we can be skeptical. We can say we don't know if the attribution is really what 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 we're talking about is real or but right. we do know the experience is inexplicable yes. people and do have experiences right. when they're near death and there you that, go and there seems to be some commonality between the stories what's causing this and what does it preclude to like may i ask right may i go, ask doubtfire mm -hmm. yeah, doubtfire what are these things that are inexplicable uh, the inexplicable, it's in the paper. I don't want to go through too, I don't want to be too long on it, but some of these are going to be the um, uh, veridical experiences. The veridical, the veridical, ver veridical. You have to veridical. find this. So veridical means that um, it's a shared experience. 
Ah, so okay. doctors in the in the laboratory. Veritable. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So they can say, so for example, let's say a patient says, hey, I know what this instrument looks like on the table that you were using to split my skull open or something like that, which is one of the examples that were put in this paper. Um, no one talked about it. No one, they didn't see it obviously at any point yet. The person says, you know, at this particular time, you guys were talking about this and then you pulled out this particular instrument that looks like that. And it was just inexplicable. They couldn't understand how did this person, how was this person able to describe that instrument the way they did if they didn't see it? Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different examples like this. And now there's in science, always, mm -hmm. in, I, and we're going to go to doubter five, but in science, there is room for things to be inexplicable. It just doesn't mean that the next best assumptions, the correct answer. It just means right. that we can't explain this for now. That is correct. Yeah. That is doubter correct. Five, what do you got? Well, for that particular instance, I would say maybe he's seen it in some kind of in a crime show or some kind of a medical show. And he just remembers seeing it several times when people were operating on other people. And then when they mentioned it, he, he drew the image from his memory. Yeah, that's true. But uh, going back to the UFO thing, uh, a lot of this is interpretation. Uh, so many people will hear the word UFO, and they won't think unidentified flying object. They think flying saucer. I mean, it's like that UFO is another word for flying saucer for them. Unfortunately. For yeah. aliens. Yeah. And it's, it's not the same thing. When someone says UFO, it means there was something in the air that they couldn't identify. Now, have you right. ever seen a UFO, Larry? Maybe we can transition. No, I've never, never seen a, well, I've seen things that I could not identify. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. at some, like later, I, I'm like one time I saw a light going across the sky, like a UFO. And uh -huh. then, you know, I realized it was the sun, which was setting, was hitting that plane against the dark background. Oh, that's interesting. And I couldn't see interesting. anything but a reflected light. Oh, that's And then that's after good. I waited for a while, I could see that it stopped reflecting and then I could yeah. see the plane, you know, things like that. Uh, George, we don't know. It's been, George, it's been a while since you jumped in the conversation. You mind unmuting yourself? I want to know, um, how do you, have you garnered anything from our discussion about near-death experiences? Do you have a better idea of what it might be? And then, on a fun level, have you ever seen a UFO? Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm old enough, believe it or not, that I remember seeing barrage balloons above New York City, above Brooklyn, New York. Wow, 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 wow. And uh, I, I just remembered that recently. That's the closest thing I've ever seen to a UFO, but there were strings attached to them. You know, they're like Flash Gordon's rockets. When you, mm. when you see the rocket ships in the Flash Gordon movie, you can, you can sort of identify that they're dangling from strings. Wow. And, and uh, these, were, these were tethered by ropes from the ground. Because I'm talking about World War II. Now, about UFOs, no. Um, about have I gleaned anything? Yes, the uh, you know the what seem to amount to scientific observations have been quite interesting to me. So yeah. that's all I can say. Yeah. I saw Hellbop's comet when I was seven years old, which means I'll be able to see it again when I'm around seventy if I make it that far. And that was my first UFO because I looked up and I'm like, that is not like anything else I've ever seen in the sky. It's like a solid meteor shower that's just frozen in place. It doesn't look like the moon. It doesn't look like any of the other stars. It's not an airplane. What the heck is that? <laughs> and there was no internet that was reliable back then. So it's just like our whole neighborhood's like, what's going on? <laughs> We get, it wasn't encyclopedias. We all, all, the only thing we had were like smart people in libraries to tell us what the thing was, and that was it. Are, that are you guys familiar with the uh, disclosure in February? No. What's the Pentagon's that? disclosure of um, um, otherworldly vehicles? No. Talk. To what? You're not familiar with that? Right. Come no. on now. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a big circulation back in February that um, they've they've released video of uh, air pilot interception of unidentified flying objects. They call them aerial uh, remote oh, uh, off-world vehicles. Mm -hmm. mm. And these things would, would uh, from what the video showed, they would go from zero to uh, 10,000 feet in less than a second, breaking all the laws of physics. And they would show this stuff on a video 
just got to look it up. I don't know what it is. Nobody's really saying it's, but apparently the Pentagon is calling it off-world vehicles. I don't know. They how are they, not. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what they say. But the video is kind of interesting. It, it shows some sort of technology that it definitely isn't a bird. It definitely isn't a plane that we're aware of. But, um, yeah, that, that I, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Ladder five, go for it, and then I'll say one thing, and then we can okay, go. Okay, it's kind of movie. funny that we started off talking about um, near-death experiences and souls and ghosts and, and end up in UFOs. <laughs> hey, but all... there is one thing that, since we are talking about UFOs, I'd like to mention. There's a, a footage, actual footage, of a battle, a battle of Los Angeles. During World War II, the UF literally fought a UFO. Oh. Uh, go to uh, just to, just search for the Battle of Los Angeles, and you'll see that there was something that we were firing at up and down the was western. Was it Venus? Uh, the left coast, huh? Was it no, Venus? No, I mean they caught it in cross. Uh, what do you call it? Searchlights. Mm -hmm. Multiple searchlights focusing hmm. on this thing, firing artillery at it for hours. Oh. And uh, they have oh. video of it and it was radio. Battle of uh, Los reports. Angeles. Battle of Los Angeles. Check it out. There we go. I'm also going to mm -hmm. go right sorry. Before we head out to our half hour break, I do want to say one thing about science that I think is really cool. In science, there are such things as undefined terms, undefined variables, mm -hmm. unknown things, sure. inexplicable things, things we don't know the answers for, just unknowns in general. And these aren't necessarily pointing at the, the, the most popular, you know, uh, conspiracy theory. It's just a recognition that science doesn't have an answer for this yet, which means that we have places to work on. Science is, like I said, it always evolving sure. process. Mm -hmm. But we got to make sure that we make the distinction of, hey, man, there's just some things and science doesn't know what it is. So maybe it's from Mars. <laughs> 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 it's like science isn't going that far. Science is just recognizing, hey, we don't know what right. this thing is. We're going to figure it out eventually. But right now, it's an unknown. And it goes into the, yep. the big uh, vault of unknown things that we're still trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't say that. Maybe correct. like an open door house. But it is fun to think about what could be. But after that point, we're outside of the realm of science and just having fun talking with each other. And there's always room for creativity like that. Um, Larry, I think we're at the bottom of the half hour. How about we uh, come back and we will do our own uh, invocation and then local news and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. This is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. And we'll be right back after this short break. Solid ground. 
103.9 FM, WOZO Radio, Knoxville. Hello and welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WZO Radio 103.5 LPFM. That's 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm Dieter Five. This is Sunday, October 11th, 2020. And let's talk about the Free Thought groups that you can join here in Knoxville. First, there's the Atheist Society of Knoxville, founded in 2002. We're in our 18th year. ASK has over a thousand members, and you can find us online at knoxvilleatheist.org. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you could still go to Meetup and search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start, Start one! one. <laughs> Another free thinking group here in Knoxville, the Rationalists of East Tennessee. To find out more about them, go to rationalist.org and click on their upcoming events. Earlier in the show, we'd said we'd talk about the Knoxville Atheist Call in TV show. Well, it's called Free Thinkers United Coalition of Knoxville, and you can find it at YouTube by searching for those words. Also, you, you can spell that up. out for me. No. <laughs> well, it's Free Thinkers United Coalition of Knoxville. Also, you might want to do a search for Free Thought Forum Knoxville, and you'll find 10 years of archives of our TV show that we had before we went video. Also, if you're interested in getting involved with the TV or this radio show, just come to an Ask Meetup, uh, RET meeting, come to our website, or Facebook page, whatever, and tell us you want to be involved. With us on the show today, we have Doubtfire, we have George, uh, Red Leader, and as ever, Wombat. Uh, take it away, Wombat. So we were talking about um, Braveheart, which was a really great movie. Oh. Um, I love the scene where William Wallace is just on his horse and he's just like, yes, you might fight and you might die today. <laughs> and dying in your dread many years from now, you would be willing to trade all those days from this day for this one chance, just one chance to come back here as young men and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they will never take our love. Where is the love? Where is the Where love? What's love, love, love got to do? Got to do love. with it. Yeah. Guys, well, we had love uh, from our really listeners. <laughs> we have some time for feedback from our listeners today. Last episode's show was called I Don't Need Evidence for My Beliefs. And that was a fun talk. I got to be honest with you. We had a full house on that one. And we had some really good love back from that. So what were some comments that we got back? Uh, Dada's Trading Room says, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Hey, did you know that wherefore actually means why? It's the literal meaning is that uh, Juliet is agonized to think that Romeo is a Montague and painfully wishes for him to come back to the other tribe or go back to the other tribe. And so I said, that sounds cool. Because <laughs> the last <laughs> joke we did was a Romeo, Romeo, Juliet thing. Uh, Nathan Matthew says, blind belief, there's got to be a better way. I mean, as Wombat said recently, doubt is your best friend. It strengthens your belief in true things. It keeps those pesky contradictions away. I've got enough stress as it is <laughs> and it's true this year has been kind of a crazy one um there's also been uh, a really fun excerpt that was pulled out of our last show it was uh se minute how you can do se in about five minutes and i said hey you can do se in five minutes all you need to do is just ask one what do you mean by that it's a great way to get people to think about what they're actually saying rather than for them just reiterating things uh -huh. they've heard other people say you can also say how can we test that and then also, how reliable is that test? And it's, really and it's really important that you stress how can we test that? Because you wanna make it a group project where you're both working together to figure out how someone's using a methodology to come to a conclusion. And then how reliable is that test? Gets, puts that focus not on their conclusion or them as a person, but on that test specifically. And that's what SC is all about. What do you mean by that? How can we test that? How reliable okay. is that test? Fantastic set of questions. Uh, Black Picket Sign says, I love Let's Chat and I'm slowly learning even sign language because of your videos. I love sign language and I love SE. And I think they're both weirdly intuitive. Um, I think it's great that you're showing me a number of wonderful things that I can incorporate in my life. Thank you. Thank you, Black Picket Sign. I appreciate that. Uh, Rise Corin also says, uh, I have been studying SE for about four years now and I've even 
taken two workshops under Magna Bosco. Trust me, SE is not complicated to learn, but the effective implementation, implementation of it is quite another beast. I've realized that in no uncertain terms, I am not clever or amiable enough to ever manage an effective talk with anyone. That's why I support those who can who can have those SE conversations and respect the hell out of them for their beliefs. Keep going on, guys. And to that, I just made a quick comment to Rice. I said, if you just keep your SE down to like variations of those three questions, what do you mean by that? How can we test that? And how is that test reliable? That's SE. Really, SE is just asking someone, how'd you figure that out? And anyone can ask that. You don't need to have a YouTube channel. You don't need <laughs> you don't need to have cameras in front of you. Ask someone how they figure that out and you're already doing SE. It's not that bad. All right. Uh, we were coming back from this show. Oh, uh, Dale, do you want to make some comments? Don't forget to unmute yourself. Go for it. Yes. For your SC. viewers who are curious about SC, uh, have you ever recommended the book by Peter Boghossian? Me personally, no. I actually think the best way to learn SC is to watch videos of people doing SC. I find Peter Boghossian's book to be a great way to understand how it started yeah. like historically uh, but mm -hmm. it's very much outdated in terms of like the suggestions that it makes and it's way more effective to just watch people do it on youtube figure out what you're comfortable with and then take some things from different people and incorporate into your own style se is not something you can learn from a book it's only going to be something you learn from going out and learning yourself and learning how to talk to people that's the best way to do it Michael Shermer on his show, uh, Science Salon, number 83, has an interview with him that lasts an hour and a half about how it started and uh, how to talk with difficult people about anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found it to be very enlightening. Good. One he thing did that coin the term SE. And uh, one thing that kind of helps me is- It's a bad like, term. <laughs> it's a really complicated word for just talking to people without sounding like a jerk. I prefer yeah. Socratic examination myself. Yeah. That fire, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I was just going to say that it's good to not have your own preconceived beliefs going into the conversation because it makes it emotionally charged on your part. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm talking to a Jehovah Witness and, you know, I have a bias against Jehovah's Witnesses or Christianity or something like that, well, if I take that attitude with me talking to them, then I'll become a little bit more challenging. And we're not yeah. there to challenge people on their beliefs. Exactly. We're just there to question, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but a lot of times the question will challenge and they, you can't, you can't so take hard. Uh, take uh, umbrage to that. Yeah, uh, you got to you know, choose you, your minefield, right? right. You're going to challenge either way, but there's a way to be like, at least I'm going to challenge the method and not you personally, or at least your conclusion. There's a way to get past that that very brittle ego mindset yeah, and get us so both hard, to working though. towards how do you get this better? Because right now you can, I can see that there's a problem here. That's why you're dancing. <laughs> what, what can we do to keep this dancing from happening? Mm -hmm. And that's fun. In my opinion, it's, it's, it's only exhausting when you try to extend a conversation longer than it needs to be, or you take on too much burden of, I'm going to change this person's mind in five minutes. That's Essie's not right. about that. Mm -mm. You are just there to help a person think about why they believe stuff and, and if how they have what good methods and good good uh, results from their method we would not want to know about that exactly it would help change our our view on the subject yeah and there's still room for argument and debates i think right. debates have a great role in society as well as argumentation and you can even throw in argumentation counter apologetics etc into your se approach but it's just good to know that you have another option and that's why um i advocate um, Socratic examination as a good way to talk to people. Okay, so we were talking about, hey, if I if I have a dream and I see a ghost, or if I become a ghost and I see my spirits, my dead parents, that's absolute proof that they exist. Isn't that right, Larry? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, that's a near-death experience. We were just talking about that for the last half hour. I'm confused. You're changing your tone. What's going on here? I'm sorry, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Love that face. <laughs> No, it's it's proof you had an experience, but how do you interpret that experience? Interpretation, you know, can yeah. uh, mirror the truth or it cannot. Or it we can not. throw out the same SC questions, like how do you test that? Like mm -hmm. is well, and I, how reliable I, is just a couple of dreams? I've met people that said, you know, they they've been in a they've been in a haunted house. I said, how do you know that? Well, while I was sitting in this chair and a mm -hmm. ghost passed over me. How do you know that? Well, mm -hmm. I get I got cold. 
Well, what do you mean by uh, that? I got a, a, you know, a cold spell. And that's what happens when a, get, a ghost passes over you. Well, they're talking about experiences and interpretation and, and results and how they interpret the results, you know, gives you the, or the experience, gives you the mindset. And one does not lead to another. It's non sequitur. But in their mind, you know, ghosts, one of the attributes of ghosts is that they cause cold. And it, we've never had a ghost to examine. We've never had a soul, a soul to examine. Uh, we can't talk about the attributes of anything until we examine one and, and find right. out what those attributes are. But the stories they've heard, the anecdotal evidence is all they need for, you know, for belief. Which is but I actually do like the guidelines of, hey, whenever you feel cold or like whenever you're sitting down and you suddenly feel cold, that's a ghost passing over you. I'm thinking to myself, hey, OK, at least now we have an actual test that we can do. Maybe we can see how repeatable it is. We can test to see how reliable it is. And in the well, event that I sit down in like a graveyard and I don't have a cold flash, is that what is that an indication of? And could you give me a point where it's like 100% chance you're going to be passed over by a ghost? Do you feel it? It's like, no, I don't feel it. I was like, oh, well, let's get another person and see if they feel anything. Depends on where the graveyard is. It's in yeah, Chicago. It's, it's like, <laughs> versus are we gonna, Miami. <laughs> are we going to warm our way out of a conclusion so that we can keep up with a hypothesis? Or are we going to just say that this test that we have isn't reliable? Maybe there are right. ghosts, but this way that we're testing it isn't the best way to go about the it. The thing about it is, um, how do you even know that ghosts cause cold? Yeah. Until you have one to examine to find out. Yep. Uh, it's just a, a, an assertion, a claim. It's the sort of thing that makes it even more complicated to test for sure. Right. Though we are talking about near-death experiences, we do have th this commonality of people saying, hey, you know, um, I did have a conversation with a person who was about to die. And when I woke up, they died. And they were telling me, hey, it's going to be all right. I'm fine. It's good. And then they wake up and like that person's dead. Maybe they worked in a hospice or they were a nurse or something like that. That story I've heard on the internet on multiple occasions. What are you saying at that point? Um, are you, and Doubtfire, I'll, I'll throw this out to you first. Are you just saying that they're all wrong? Right. So for me, it comes back to how are we defining our terms like real and everything? Because, I mean, think about it. Uh, I saw a really good TED talk from a neurologist who said, basically, we hallucinate our entire reality. <laughs> our whole experience is kind of like a, a hallucination. Now, like, I can I could see you watching that TED talk at least three times. Just yeah, like, dude, I watched uh, it. And, Brian and, Bacon, you know, like, man, this thing's got. And the way he breaks, I mean, it sounds kind of, uh, kind of uh, crazy at first, but the way the guy breaks it down, he kind of puts it all in perspective for you and everything. But basically, though, still the um, the core essential is there. When people dream, dreams feel real. They 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 feel like. You know, when you dream of falling off a mountain in your sleep, hmm. I mean, you're you're literally terrified, okay? So there's an emotional, your brain fires up. I mean, all these things become a real experience for you. So when these people have these near-death experiences, are they real? Well, what do you mean? You mean, is, is does this mean the afterlife is real? Or are you talking about, is the experience real? Or are you just making it up or maybe embellishing it? Um, I don't know. I mean, I've never had a near death experience, so I really can't say I know what it's all about or anything like that, but I can read some of these scientific journals and we can take that route and they can say, look, they, it seems like these people are having a real experience. These commonalities are inexplicable, but that's as far as they go with it. Because I mean, consciousness is something we can't really predict with physics. I mean, consciousness is an, in, an internal experience. It's subjective. There's no, mm. you know, science by nature is objective. Uh, consciousness by its nature is subjective. So right now we've got a little, uh, a little gap there. Um, so I don't know. My personal take on, if you were to ask me my personal take, I'd say I'm 50-50. I don't know anything. I do know that there is a difference between imaginary things and uh, real things out there yeah. in the world. Like, you know, there's a difference between a dream and my waking life. I can tell that there's a difference. One I can control, um, others I can't. You know, I can't, I can't jump off a mountain and fly like I can in my dream. So there's a difference there. So you're working by a different set of rules. 
Right, different set of rules. So it seems like this NW, this NDE thing is kind of like a dream in a way. It's not really out there. No one can see these dead loved ones but the person themselves that are going through mm. it. But but let me say this. Um, I kind of think about this stuff in my life. It kind of helps me. Even if I don't believe in an afterlife, I have no reason to think I'm going to live on after my death. None. I have none. But... If I thought that I was going to have a near-death experience at the end of my life and there's this life review thing that happens that yeah. I'm pretty sure does happen, then it kind of makes me feel like I want to be a good person. <laughs> I don't want my last experience to be, you were a bad person to this guy and that guy. You know, I don't want that. I don't, I sure. definitely don't want, I want to go off with, you know, on a good, you know, note. Okay. Hey, that's so, an interesting set of questions. I'm going to throw this out to George first. Um, would you, now this isn't a question of, do you think near death experiences actually exist? This is more of, would you like to have one when it's your time? I have no idea. Don't say that. Come on, give me something. Give me something. Give However, me I, you know, in, Would you in like listening to be pleasantly to surprised with one. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to be pleasantly surprised, but you know, in in listening to some bits and pieces of what people have been saying right now, um, I'm thinking about shared psychopathy. Okay. Like um, that, that I'm living in a world now that is a cult. It's, it's just this big, huge cult of shared beliefs because people have heard them uh, repeated so many yeah. times. Mm. You know, this this I think is coming coming forward from. I believe we had a discussion last week um, where. Uh, so I, I think we, we were mentioning something like if 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 a, if something was repeated enough times, people would begin to believe them. You know. Yep, absolutely true. And I believe that. You, that's the hallucination yeah, point. I believe that. Yeah. What's that's that? What it is that that's the hallucination factor. We we construct our reality based on our experiences, what we're told, our influences, our genetics. Blah blah yeah. blah blah blah. I'll throw this out just real quick to just add on to George's story at this point. Like I remember talking in to an electrician who was at our job and we were talking about old presidents. And I was like, yeah, isn't it funny how like a lot of people believe that Ben Franklin actually flew a kite with a, a, of a key at the end of it in a lightning storm and he was hit with lightning, but all the lightning just stuck in the yeah. key. And he was just like, I discovered electricity. Like, isn't that a silly story? And the electrician looks at me, he's like, that actually happened. I was like, no way, no way. Is that even feasible? You would be a dead human being on the spot. You know how much okay. LNG is in a Yeah, yeah, but Tyrone, look. Oh, it's in all these, Tyrone. It's in all these books. I mean, yeah. we've we've it's heard these stories. You know, I I uh, I I must tell the truth. I I chopped down the cherry. Yeah, thing, yeah right? that never happened you either. Like we, <laughs> we, we, we've been indoctrinated, and and it's you know it's like my ex-wife mm. uh, was an editor was an editor and a very good one. And at one point, she was editing plant books. For a, for a very well-known publisher of plant books. And I was helping her on one of these projects, and she explained to me that the, the people who write plant books steal material from each other, and they steal material from other books. And, and it's all plagiarism is rampant in that field. And so what they do is they make up some, they, they make up some falsehood about a plant, and they bury it in, oh. in something that they wrote about, you know, to see where that falsehood there is repeated, in. you know. Nice. And then it's like, now I know you plagiarized me because I made this up. That's yes, exactly, exactly. Doubt or, doubt or and, five, what? And, and and so you know what brought this to my mind now was um, when Larry said this thing about when a ghost passes overhead you feel cold. Yeah. 
where the hell does that come from? You know? Yeah. yeah. Who it's started a, that meme? You know? Would, is it is it to call it an old wives' tale in 2020, or should we just call it like a really bad rumor, or just, just a meme? an old? Why ad. are they always wearing uh, chains? They're always. I didn't ever <laughs> thought about chains. I never thought about them with yeah. chains. I thought Ghost white clothes. sheets at most. Sure. Better five. What do you got? Ghost clothes. <laughs> I like to get back to what you were talking about on memory. Uh, you yeah. remember things this way or that way. Yeah. Uh, there was a quote that I like to bring to the table on that. It says, uh, memory is not a, a recorder. Mm -hmm. I mean, people think of it as a recorder, yeah. but it's more like a wiki page. Not only can you change it, but other people can change it too. Oh, George loves that. He's laughing so hard right now. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm laughing because uh, I don't know. I, I like, I love Wikipedia, but there's BS on there. You know, yeah. I mean, I would, Larry, to modify that, I wouldn't say memory is a wiki page. I would say it's more of like an improv sketch troupe that has to just recreate it on the spot. Like they just yeah. got the little card and they're like, uh, third grade recital, let's go. Ah! And then your memory's like, yeah, that's the way that happened. And your brain's like, yeah. I'm totally fine with this. Yeah. But um, it, would, it can actually change after, uh, after you have like some kind of comfort. Uh, conversation with yeah. other people who were theoretically there and they yeah. tell mm -hmm. you their version of it. Yeah. Well, all of a sudden you start working their version into your memory. Yeah. Like it, you can sit down and just say, okay, I'm going to remember something that happened in my past, but I'm going to do it with a red shirt on. Now I'm going to do it with a blue shirt on. It's so easy to do. <laughs> and you so have to easy. be, con you have to be aware of the fact that your brain does this all the time mm -hmm. and that the memories right. that you have are just recreations that your brain's just pulling together and putting confidence on so that you feel like you did something <laughs> like they're amazing or cool or something. The things that you don't want to remember get murkier and like fall away with details, but just be aware of that. Uh, Dale, what's the final words on near death experiences? Um, from our talks today, do you feel like there's validity in saying, Hey, I know you had an experience, but there's not much to correlate that with an objective reality. Do you think that's fair to say? Oh man! I think... What? No, it looked like you were cutting out. Go for it. Go for it. You're doing fine, Dan. Uh, I think it's fair to say that unlike ghosts, you can create near-death experiences anytime you want to. I can give one to Doubter Five with just about three minutes of training. Yep. Oh. But that's <laughs> a little bit dangerous. It's Nobody. easy to do, <laughs> and the pilots reproduce it all the time. So I really don't spend a lot of time. I, I, like I say, I worked for a guy that wrote a book on it. He was a Christian. He himself admitted that uh, the lack of uh, oxygen and blood pressure is what creates them. But from a Christian point of view, he wanted to go with how did this near-death experience affect this person's life? Did they convert to Christianity, so forth and so on? That's all I got to say about that. Nice. So we got four minutes left in the show. I'm just going to round out. Larry, you got the last words. Doubt or five? I'm mean, sorry. Doubt fire. We got to change your, we got to figure out some way to go around this, but doubt fire, Scott, uh, any last words on near death experiences? Um, I just think that they're fascinating, man. Um, I've looked into them for years. My sister had a near death experience is what really triggered it all off. And she's, you know, it's, it's just inexplicable. I don't, I don't really believe that we live on, but that might be just my own personal incredulity argument. I don't know. I don't care. It is what it is. There's nothing I can do about it anyways. But I tell you what, I don't want my last experience to be negative. If, if I'm one of those 20% of people that have this experience, I don't want to be one of these people with a negative experience. So it kind of helps me think about being a good person each day. So it has nice. some value as a value. Okay. Yeah. George, any last words on near death experiences? No, I'm too busy listening. Fair enough. Fair enough. I would say this. Thank you. Like you, can draw, yes. you can draw a lot of comfort from the idea that your death will be more of a transition than a final period. And oh. I find a lot of correlations between near-death experiences and theistic-based religions in general, whereas people 
trying to make sense and rationalize a reality that is very much inscrutable and has, is filled with a bunch of unknowns. And there is comfort in believing in a God that's watching out for you and has a plan for you and will show you a video of all the good deeds you've done at the end of your life. Or establish that when you do die, you are just changing your address and going to a different place. But there's not good rationale to believe that. It might be true, but there's not a good reason to believe that at this point. And I care more about believing things for good reasons than believing things because they're comfortable. And I can find many good reasons to be comfortable without a near-death experience supporting that, or to be nice to people, or to have uh, a reason to be kind to others. And I think people should just be aware that there's, there's very good options to you, even if you don't believe in a God or a near-death experience to be a good person. Out of five, what do you want to round up about? Uh, I believe that the I, the we, the, my, the, the myself, is a mind that a working brain produces. Uh, when the brain dies, the mind ends. There's no, we have no trouble believing that everything else in the world dies when it, when it dies and does not continue. But we have to have special pleading. We live forever. We can't die. And it's just the hubris on my, my, by my count, I'll put it that way. Uh, this has been, uh, as we're going to go ahead and close out the show, this has been the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. Be sure to visit the digitalfreethought.com for our little show. I can't talk. The radio show archives, atheist songs, and many other articles on the subject. My book is called Atheism. What's it all about? It's available on Amazon. Uh, I want to welcome all the old and new guests back to the show anytime. Please come every Sunday morning when we do this recording. If you're having trouble relieving religious beliefs behind, visit recoveringfromreligion.org. They have help for you. If you have questions for the show, then you can send them to askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org, and we'll try to answer them in the future shows. You can also, if you're watching these on YouTube, list them in the comments below, and we'll get to them then. Remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we see you next Wednesday. Say goodbye, everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 And that's a wrap. Right.